Hi everyone, and thank you for coming out because I know how cold it is. Um, so yeah, so Alex and I are going to talk a little bit about a project that we've been working on for quite a while. And the Me++ is all about data ethics, biometrics, and creating augmented reality ballet. So um, we've been working together since 2012. Um, we are definitely, well, I say, he says we're not te domain tech experts. He is. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> we've done three large-scale data-driven dance performances before, all about computer science theory and pain gateways and biometric data beforehand. Um, we had a little bit more of a challenge due to COVID with this one because we presented back in 2018 <laughs> that we were going to do this and the technology stack was very different um, and we had to overcome and are still overcoming some challenges. So I think, yeah, I just <laughs> wanted to say about the tech stack thing is I'm a programmer, sure, but all the stuff that we've picked up along the way, we've just been doing it for the sake of the project and so suddenly you have to learn a little bit about machine learning and suddenly learning a little bit about you know, uh, inverse camera projections or whatever it is. And so don't expect somebody who's really knowledgeable yes. <laughs> on stage today. We're doing this for the creativity and for, you know, for the performance and... Yeah, so one stuff. of the things that we're... Is, it's actually part of my PhD research, which is looking at new creative ways for um, raising awareness of data ethics in the computer science classrooms for trainee teachers. Um, and so data ethics is not really covered in the teaching practice. It used to be, but it's no longer anymore. Um, and we look at things like the new children's code. And for those of you who are interested about the theory side of it, so I have a philosophical framework that kind of draws in things like post-humanism, uh, with Karen Barad and uh, Anushka Bailey. We also talk about uh, Papad's constructionism, so he's all to do with computing and education. And then if you're interested it would be, um, about information and the ethics of information, that would be Luciano uh, Floridi. I've tweeted out some stuff already. They'll be coming through in the next half an hour, so you'll have all of those links if you're interested in that. Um, and then one of the things that we have here is the um, emotive uh, brainwave headset. So this is a commercial headset. It uses the particular one we use that you can see on the dancer here. It's a five channel headset. Um, whereas if you were doing it for neuroscience, you'd need something like 32 channels. And again, they're not really designed for dancing because the amount of motion you get on the data, which I'll show you in a minute, um, is, it just makes it actually unusable, but it's actually great for data art great for manipulation of data, st uh, data sets because it just exports for CSV. Um, we haven't quite fully anonymized those data sets yet in order to share with you because of the data ethics protocols of my PhD. Uh, once Cambridge sign it off, then I can share the data sets with you. So for those of you who don't really know much about EEG, the headset's just capturing, uh, capturing it's a passive device that captures the electrical activity expressed in different frequencies, and they use a particular algorithm um, called a fast Fourier transfer um, to actually record the, the raw signals. And it has four main categories of signals that it does, which is a beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Um, so the beta waves are like of, of your conscious state, and they are 14 hertz to 30 hertz. Alpha waves are 7 to 13 with being relaxed and calm. If I had mine on now, which I left at home, it's right by my front door. <laughs> Very sad. Um, it wouldn't be relaxed, I can tell you that. Um, and then the theta waves, which is often found in young, young adults. We don't really necessarily see these waves, uh, the 4 to 7 hertz in adults. And the data is the sort of, uh, so, uh, delta is associated with kind of sleep. So yeah, so this is what it looks like when you record it. And the rows uh, represent the particular positions of the points. And this is a standard called the 1020 International System of labeling all of these different points. Um, so you have a really big, um, you know, 32, 48 channel headset. Each one of those points has a little label um, and that's what it's showing. So hopefully it'll run. So this is me in a ballet class on Zoom um, and as you can see, the motion, and again, I was just doing bar work, but the amount of motion that you use with your head um, just creates massive amounts of artifacts that you don't normally get in a sort of neuroscience uh, state. Um, and it kind of links in with the data ethics side of it, of um, the sort of 
Cognitive Liberty, which is Dr. Nita Farhane's, um, she's a professor of law and philosophy at Duke University. Um, she's done some amazing research on that whole area since 2008. Um, and then also, we don't really have any frameworks for ed tech companies to kind of take these devices into education. And it's one of the things that us as educators are quite cautious of. Um, so there's a couple of frameworks that are coming out or have come out. So the Australian Neuroethics Framework of 2019, and also the, the IEEE uh, Brain Initiative Neuroethics Framework, which is probably coming out next year. Um, so for me, it's really about how can we think about sharing our data when, especially when young people, they're so datafied in the education sector, they're datafied from birth. So we're talking about Sonia Livingston's kind of work. And, you know, every time they go into a classroom, they're registered on their, like, whether they were there, how, what their behavior might be like, whether they completed their homework. So us as educators need to think about what, who owns and what is happening with that data later on so that we can educate the students to then think about what is their personal data. So this is the idea of the me plus plus. There's my human self and my data self. And a lot of the time, we're not really aware of it and what could be done with that data. I mean, obviously, we can go and think about the kind of real dystopian side of it. Let's draw that back and maybe think about how the cool things, what we can do with these data sets. When we're using the emotive one, it just exports to a CSV, which means that we can use this with the Raspberry Pi to light up some amazing lights. You can actually use it to connect to stage lighting. Um, you can do data sonification. I mean, the world's your oyster, really, because it's just a CSV. So, oops, sorry. I just need to go back then. So one of the things that I've been playing with is how to humanize these data sets. This is a really fun website. And basically, you type in your name, and it, it capitalizations change it. You can have any particular style on there. This is just actually a, a, an, an image. Um, and there's actually a GitHub repo if you want to repurpose this for yourself. So for my um, co-collaborators, I'm not really going to call them participants, because they inform exactly what I do and how much information that we uh, transfer and, and make with the project. Um, each, one of the, um, each one of the collaborators created their own little boring avatar, and that's how I associate the data with them when I'm talking about each of the participants. So feel free to have a play with that, because it's quite fun. And I'm going to pass over to the actual fun bit, which is Alex and all of the mocap stuff that we've done. Um, so, Alex, over to you. Yeah, so... Um, oh, thank you. Um, this is uh, a screenshot uh, central from OpenPose, um, which does two-dimensional two uh, recognition from, uh, two-dimensional pose recognition from an RGB camera, just like an ordinary webcam. Um, over there in the top left, there is a screenshot from MoCapNet that does, converts those points from 2D to 3D so they are effectively posed in a 3D space. And um, this rather uncomfortable avatar here um, is us using that data to create an augmented reality model that you can watch perform and move around the stage. Um, so as part of all this, uh, we've developed quite a, an unusual tech stack because most motion capture, certainly 3D motion capture, doesn't happen with an ordinary two-dimensional webcam, and this is a hard and new technology. So it was part of the regulations because of COVID, we couldn't actually meet in person. So therefore, we couldn't actually motion capture them how we would have done normally. So we actually had to go, we had to find a way, and that took longer than expected. Um, but this is the tech stack. But that was the reason why we didn't do it in person. So this is just reiterating why <laughs> I haven't checked my slides. Um, um, so yeah, that's an ordinary video. That is 2D points, like here is my elbow, here's my arm. Um, that's 3D points, and um, that's, an, that's rotations. So we don't store the data as points anymore, points anymore when we create a, um, an animated skeleton. Um, of the people. We just store the elbow is at 90 degrees, 45 degrees. Um, create a model, um, which is usually done in um, 
make human and export it to Blender. And then we're using Unity to combine all this stuff together to actually make it interactive and be able to watch it on a mobile device. Um, ooh, I have lost connection. Um, cool. Um, but yeah, so a lot of this is based on machine learning and using TensorFlow. Uh, so we have a lot of built-in kind of, this is based around, um, oh, thanks. Hey, cool. Um, oh, you didn't want to? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so this is based around a, um, a set of, Basically, it mimics how a human would recognize the, you know, a particular pattern. So if you saw, you know, a set of dots, like dot, 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 you'd realize that my hand, you know, it, and they were marked as arm, you'd realize it was an outstretched hand fully to the side. Computer doesn't have that intuition, but you can train it. And that's kind of the principle that we've, um, we, um, we've, we've been piggybacking on in order to develop a lot of this. So yeah, that's um, an example of inside Blender. Um, the outside is a representation, it's the 3D model, and the inside is what the, the skeleton rotations and the animations are applied to. Um, we use a specific model that uh, MocapNet exports, um, which is the CMU body and face model, which is a very detailed, um, you can see it's got like face and hands, um, it's got points for all those parts of the body, um, much more detailed than a computer um, game, which is kind of what Unity is expecting. Um, so we have had to write our own custom BVH animation software. Um, that took a long time because, like I said, I'm not a domain expert, and so I had to learn a lot about quaternions and global versus local rotation spaces, and generally blew my brain um, just trying to get this all in. Um, that's an Amiga, by the way. The Amiga's not running this. Um, and the idea is that by running this, making this in Unity, it can be deployed to a, um, a mobile phone or a tablet or thing. So you can see something like, like this, um, where you are empowered to move around the scene and you can explore the ballet from whichever angle you want, uh, which adds a, a layer of immersion and a sort of a personal depth that you can't really experience from watching TV. But yeah, so the challenge is, is that MocapNet was written by academics and not games software engineers. So they don't necessarily match up. Um, so that's one of the challenges that we've come across. Um, so we had one bit where we were testing the data and so the legs were here and then within the 3D space, the torso was five miles away. So it, there's some really funny and also some very scary test data. <laughs> Uh, we'll show you a little bit later the least scary stuff that we've created. Um, but yeah, uh, it's not exactly what we wanted it to work out like. So we're still working on, but it, this is the challenge when you're dealing with trying to motion capture via basically things like Zoom or, or recording on your mobile phone. So we tested the, the video RGB data at 30 frames and 60 frames a second because dance has a lot of rotation. Um, and you need that kind of frame rate in order to capture a lot of the data um, so that hopefully these actual, um, as you can see, definitely a duct tape process. <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of motion blur is, is the big issue. And if you're, you're sending a frame to uh, basically a very simple human who has to then figure out what's going on with all that blur, it's like, is it going to recognize an arm? Maybe not. So trying to keep your, um, your capture rate as fast as possible uh, means that you minimize the, uh, the amount of motion blur, which is a bit of a consideration. Something else that we did, which has suddenly crept in on this slide, is the YOLO V5. Um, YOLO is called You Only Look Once, and it's another layer of neural networks that detects objects. And so we say, just give us where the dancer is, and cut it out. 
Um, the reason for doing this is a lot of this processing is very, very CPU intensive or GPU intensive. And it kind of, um, so normally what we want to do is reduce the RGB video to a really low resolution so it can process it in a reasonable time. And if you just let it do that, like from your, um, your high resolution video capture, you'll end up with like, you know, a few pixels on the screen, which is not good when you reach the open pose stage because it just goes, well, that's just a few pixels. Um, so what we do is we use YOLO to extract the bit that we're interested in, in the dancer, and expand that out to full size before we pass it to open, um, open pose. And, uh, you know, so that can have a more optimal um, resolution to work with. Yeah, and also most of the um, so most of these kind of motion tracking machine learning algorithms like OpenPose or or mocap.net have been trained um, not on ballet dancers who don't move in a normal traditional way. <laughs> um, so things like trying to get ones that articulate the ankles. So your feet are in the wrong position for a start. No, nobody does sort of any of <laughs> nobody the. Nobody stands this. like this. <laughs> um, and the other thing is actually going up on point. Um, so they they're not they're not trained. So they assume that no matter what you're doing, whether you're jumping or whatever, you're always going to have your ankle flexed, even maybe slightly. Um, and then also when you jump or saute. Um, in, with a ballet dancer, they tend to have very straight legs and close together. That's not naturally how we, ju how we jump. Um, so the training data tends to go, okay, okay, okay uh, where's the arm? Where's the leg? Oh, there it is. And so you end up with like, and especially if it's above shoulder height, it's not expecting your leg to be up here. Um, so we've had legs coming out of heads and lost arms for like, you know, several frames and then eventually it pops back up again somewhere. Um, which is funny and brilliant for research, but terrible for trying to create an augmented reality ballet. <laughs> but we'll get there in the end. But yeah, go ahead. Well, next slide. <laughs> yep. Okay, so this, if, if you're uncomfortable with, um, Creaky sort humans. of, yeah, an unusual human movement. Um, you might want to shut your eyes for 20 seconds. Yeah, um, they're not attached where they should be but, and, or in the right orientation. So just warning you. <laughs> so the skin of the avatar was chosen by one of the performers whose, whose data this is. This is what they wanted to look like in the test data. They didn't really want to look like this in the test data. <laughs> but the kind of, you know, the aesthetic, shall we say. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, it's not quite working. <laughs> but this is technically the, um, the first ballet performance displayed live on the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so in order to, as you can see, this is highly complex, highly technical. Um, kind of understanding of machine learning algorithms, um, also requiring a lot of installed software and beyond me, um, <laughs> but also beyond a lot of our computer science um, kind of capabilities in the classroom, generally uh, to do with networks and maybe some of the, and, and a lot of the programming languages might not be familiar to uh, computer science teachers. So I use something called p5.js. I uh, don't know if you've heard of that, but you can edit online. It's all web enabled. So, um, and they use a machine learning al algorithm called ML5, which is based on PoseNet. Um, and so Alex, <laughs> you're going to dance. <laughs> so bear with me a second um, while I just get this back. So here we have um, a couple of the um, meshes that we're going to show you live. Oh, this is, you should never live demo, should you? Anyway, um, but bear with me. Um, I've tweeted these out, so you should be able to have the links and I can share it later. So there's one which is just face mesh. So these work on mobile phones as well, which is really cool. Um, the next one is with filters. And this is really talking about the Me++. Plus Plus. So it's got an offset of the skeleton tracking. It's got a mirror of, of me. This is me in my ballet lessons, <laughs> no judgments. Um, and then the black and white, so, it's, so we're using all the ideas of the filters and stuff. So Alex, first of all, 
I'm just going to um, load these up. Um, so all of this code is available um, and free, and there's a million and one training videos um, um, on the coding train. It takes a second, obviously, because uh, bear with it, it will work. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Poor little computer. Hello, here we are. And here's me and Alex having a chat. <laughs> and then I'm just going to check. Is this the... Yeah, okay. And then I'm going to move it slowly so I can see Alex. It'll take a second or two. And then just... So you can see it's picking up the dots here. Um, and what you can see is that it, it'll still pick them up, but there's no feet and there's no full hands. So for ballet, that doesn't quite work. But from a trainer, from a teacher perspective, it's a really awesome tool. Um, and the code isn't too complicated if you're used to doing JavaScript. But also, I've done this with people who've never looked at JavaScript before. And what we do is we get, we just go through and talk about. Sorry, I need to get my stick. So what we really look at are things like how the how the pose. Uh, function works and if you go into the NL5 site um, you can actually see um, how they do that uh, but the main thing that we look at is the function here and where it's going to be where it's going to be and then we just look basically from a teaching perspective how we're going to actually position these on the screen is that we're just making a circle and we're doing a and then we're drawing a line between the points, which is actually how it works. Um, don't kill yourself. <laughs> um, and then we can get them to play around with a lot of the different filters as well. So we're playing, so we're linking with all of those other different aspects uh, of the computing classroom. Um, and again, you can draw in, um, you can draw in data into these um, as well. So it's a really lovely platform to use because it doesn't need any installation. It just runs off the web. So these are the pose nets if you wish to have a go yourselves. And then I'll just go back to my slide deck. Sorry about that. So it's also kind of like how the open pose stage of the, the main pipeline we develop works. So it's a good way to sort of get into that and understand sort of how much you, data you can get that looks like a human being but is in two dimensions. Yeah, so, um, so this has got the um, x-ray threshold on it and different colors and things like that. So there's different ways that you can do it. So one of the challenges that we can do, um, either talking to you guys or in the classroom, is bringing in a little bit about what is machine learning and what is ethical machine learning. The fact that it makes assumptions on body types, that you are actually, full, you know, you do have two arms and two legs. It doesn't... It's not trained on ballet um, movement, so therefore it's expecting very normal, you know, maybe running, maybe a little bit of kind of like, you know, dad dancing, whatever. I mean, they've done some really cool kind of break dance and stuff, but it still doesn't work with the, the way that our ballet dancer moves. And then the challenge, if you look on the kind of dystopian side, is where are they using all of these facial recognitions, body tracking? Because you've got to remember your brainwave data, um, or your brainwave fingerprint is unique to you, the same as your gait. So there are some, a lot of implications in terms of the ethical kind of negative side that might be used in terms of, you know, the police and the military. Um, and then obviously the deep faking. Yeah, so when you've, um, if you're not familiar with deep faking at this point, it's basically being able to represent somebody else using, or represent somebody doing something they wouldn't normally be doing, using a, an ML um, platform to, you know, create their representation. And as we're, as we're doing here, we're just kind of replacing a fairly ordinary looking computer model um, and animating it with a natural human motion. But uh, it could be used to represent people in different ways yep. and, yeah. I've not encountered a use for this particularly. Yeah, this is, this is a rant. I'm getting this in now because <laughs> I've been trying to debug stuff using some of these tools, which I will not name. Um, <laughs> and because of the weird open source, not quite open source academic policies, some things are just, you know, they've, they've published a paper, they've published the results open source. 
but you can't actually get into the process of developing your own models and things because some part of this is kept hidden by university policy. And you can go and talk to the people who developed this and they'll be like, I really want to share this with you. Mm -hmm. But institute policy. And it is such a pain. Yeah, yeah, that's my rant over. <laughs> so, so what we could also do with the data is data sonification. So you can do this with the brainwave or you can do this with the skeleton tracking. Um, and we use, um, in teaching, we use um, Sonic Pi, but you can do it in Python. And, and there's lots of different ways that you can represent the data in terms of emotion, et cetera, with that. We will share the code, but again, the data hasn't been fully anonymized yet for us to share that with you. Um, but it's a really nice tool. I'm a massive fan of Sonic Pi and obviously p5.js. So, so yeah, so just to wrap up, um, it's really, we've just wanted to share with you that actually um, the things that you can do in the computing classroom, you can bring in really complex subjects such as data ethics, and it can be really fun in terms of how we can look at data manipulation and things like the hidden nature of, uh, of biometric data through your skeleton tracking and, the fact, and your beautiful brainwaves. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. <laughs>